We are Maria and Nicole. We're two secular homeschooling moms that have been been there, done done that. that. Welcome to episode seven, how to find your people. Today, we're going to be discussing co-ops, university model, and micro schools. And we're going to be talking about how to find support, how to locate homeschool groups, and how to form your own group. And as usual, we want to stress that our podcast is an inclusive space Definitely. for your everyday parents that are looking for education options. We are not here to convince you to homeschool. Uh, we want to stress that you need to do what works for your child and for your family. Every family is different. Absolutely. And you know your children best. So uh, feel free to take what advice or information you get from here that works for you and chuck the rest. Hey, Maria, how's it going? Hi, Nicole. I'm doing great. How are you? Well, I'm a little disappointed because typically before we start recording every episode, I see our podcast possum walk across the back of your yard and it's raining out. It's nice because it's been so dry in Texas, but I'm hoping my little possum is okay out there. I know. I wonder if it's only one possum, like living under your house. Mm, typically, they digging are in up families, right? Yeah. I don't oh, know. Let's not talk about what he might. You be don't doing want to really think about what the possum foundation. is doing. Uh, but yeah, podcast possum. It's like our <laughs> mascot. We're going to have to take a picture of him and put him on the website. I know. I, right now, I only have bad pictures, but oh, maybe we'll do a TikTok. Oh, we're gonna have a <laughs> have a podcast possum TikTok. I yeah. love it. He'll be yeah. everybody's best friend. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of friends, do homeschoolers even have any? <laughs> well, uh, we've actually been asked that often. Yep. <laughs> One time we had a repair guy over here, and it was during the day, and it was a really relaxing day. The kids were both doing independent work, and I was just doing the dishes and walking around, puttering around the house. And he found out that they homeschooled because he was curious. Why? Why are your kids here? And I told him, and he actually looked at me and goes, "So when are you going to introduce your kids to the public?" <laughs> like you never, like you never have gone anywhere. Like you've never left your house. Well, when he left, Cameron kept all day long. Mom, when are you going to introduce us to the public? <laughs> you should have been like, well, the electrician was here last week. Like, so now he's met two. They've met two people. <laughs> That's so crazy. People, people really do think that sometimes. There's a myth that homeschooling is socially isolating. And that is often what keeps a lot of families from trying this awesome, beneficial form of education. The truth is that there are so many ways in which parents can connect their homeschoolers with others their age. They just need to be proactive. Given homeschooling's increasing popularity, especially uh, in the wake of COVID-19, parents can take the following measures to ensure that their children interact meaningfully with peers. So one of the easiest ways that we can make that uh, interaction happen is to plug into homeschool groups. And I do want to say that you can often find lists of homeschool groups on websites like HSLDA and state-specific groups like uh, like here in Texas, we have THSC, Texas Homeschool Coalition. It's important to know you don't actually have to become a member of these types of associations to access this information. Many of these are actually political lobbying groups. And like we've mentioned before, homeschoolers, you know, differ. We vary greatly and often, like sometimes we don't even homeschool for the same reasons. So these groups might not represent you and your family and their lobbying efforts, and you don't have to be a part of those. Hey, I've never even been in one. Have you? Uh, no, one like I, I haven't wanted to. I see people say this a lot on forums, like first thing to do as a homeschooler is to join these and pay the money. And I like you don't have to do that. Like all of this stuff is available online for free. Right. Another thing that would be really important along these lines is social media. Great place to find groups. Right. Capitalize on that. And social media can be used to keep your children connected to their friends. Uh, Just join or create a Facebook group. Like around a specific goal or activity. It can be, you know, things like science experiments, singing. Great place for you to connect with other families and meet online and then eventually meet in In person. Yeah. And you can even plan things in groups. Uh, A lot of groups welcome that. Um, Again, the key word here is to be proactive. 
So yeah, there uh, there's all kinds of different places that you can find homeschool groups. Do you remember when, like back in the day, it was all Yahoo groups? Yahoo groups. That's exactly what my first homeschool group was a home- Yahoo group. My husband was talking about uh, us posting on a Yahoo group the other day, and I was like, oh no no no, those aren't a, those aren't a thing anymore. Um, but like most of my groups now are, I, I've really found on Facebook. Um, I, though there's other places like uh, I do I do have a group that operates on Meetup. Um, and some other things like that. But on Facebook, you can find like everything like there are uh, national homeschool or national international homeschool groups that are just like very generic, like Homeschool 101. Um, we are part of a lot of local or regional groups. Like I'm part of a Collin County group. I'm part of a I'm in the one that's based in McKinney. And we it's been a huge part of our life. They have a lot of teen meetup things and, and events. And I've scheduled many of myself over the years. And so there's there's really you just have to be proactive. Go out there, find some groups do some Google searches, you're, you're going to find your people, you're going to find sometimes there's groups that are specific to an interest that your child might have right there, the chess, chess groups, and you know, yeah, book clubs, what have you. Yeah, we've um looking uh, into specific worldview groups or different curriculum based groups like, uh, you know, we use a curriculum called build your library, and they have all kinds of uh, message board groups like one for each level uh one for families doing it one for high school um Mm -hmm. uh, same with a you know life of fred math group uh five in a row or moving beyond the page all those yeah so some of those have uh specific groups on facebook um some different curriculums might have their own forums still like well-trained mind uh that's always funny i have a like friend somebody in a group or, or click on them and then notice that I have like a bunch of mutual friends. And I always know immediately that these must be people from the well-trained mind forum because <laughs> they've been, they've known each other for like so long, like never met in person, but like we're all interconnected with all these different people. It's always funny. Right. A lot of age specific groups. So if you have three children under the age of 10, so you might want to not join any of the teen groups at that point. So you can dry, join some elementary age groups. So your children connect with children that are the same age. Right. Or high school, you know, once you're in high school, there's some very specific homeschooling uh, things that go with that, especially if you're doing dual credit or you and um, I add graduation together. One very large uh, teen we group. <laughs> we do. We actually admin a couple of groups together. Don't we all so, oh no, that's somebody else that we do the <laughs> dual credit group as well. But there's, you know, specific oh, actually, things. That is me. <laughs> is it? I, oh. <laughs> I can't even keep track of how many groups we uh, moderate together. But you, you really can find all these specifics. Uh, there's groups for kids with disabilities or uh, gifted children. You know, very specific things. You can kind of find it broad or narrowed. Oh, in addition to Meetup and Facebook, there's also Discord and Homeschool Life. Yeah, I don't even know what Discord is because I'm old, but I saw a mom like ask about it one time. So I know that it's a thing. (laughs) Sale uses that one a lot. uh, That must be the young young moms (laughs) or on the Discord. Or am I just really old? Well, I'm older than you and I use Discord. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. And I I used to, oh gosh, this is like a blast from the past. But remember like some of these groups like Baby Center or Mothering had like homeschool forums on their community message boards. I used to moderate. What were the damn moms on? D A M. I don't. That was Dallas before my time. Moms. Oh, but I was trip. in a Charlotte mommies and a Jacksonville mommies group that was like that too. <laughs> so and I and I did moderate the homeschool forum at each of those. So uh, tons and tons of information out there and support groups out there on social media. Find them, but you also want to find, uh, and sometimes it's through there, is the in person support. You want to find some local. I always recommend find a park day group. Park group day. that just meets well, at the park. especially for the littles, so important. Getting the kids outside, first of all, they're burning off energy, they're learning, they're interacting with other children on the playground. And so uh, a regular park group is super important for little kids. Yeah, absolutely. They really just need to be out there with their friends. And really, most of the really cool homeschool stuff that I learned was from sitting around for hours at the park, like just talking with the moms while our kids played. I was really into, I had read an article when my kids were little about, it was about like road tripping and picnicking. And the mom was talking about how she, instead of bringing like disposable stuff, she brought like all this picnic wear that she had bought and stuff. And I thought it was so cool. So I bought my own like really fancy picnic (laughs) wear. And like that actually attracted like friends to me. 
Like I, if people start at like I would everybody go to lady. the yeah the picnic <laughs> at the homeschool park day, and I would lay out like a blanket and a picnic tablecloth and like all my gear, and everybody would like be like, "What's she doing?" And so by and by, like all my friends started also buying fancy picnic gear, and then we were like a whole group of people with fancy picnic gear at the lunch. It was really funny. And you've also mentioned other places. You've met moms just out to Target. You know, if you have school age kids during the middle of the day. And you're walking around the store and you see another mom. I mean, you've struck up conversations. You have good oh, for friends sure. That you, oh my gosh, yeah. yeah. I mean, even like you know, being at the library, you see somebody there during the day with their kids. You're like, hey, are you guys homeschoolers too? <laughs> Let's be best friends. How about that? Um, and also, just um, this isn't really like a support group or an in-person support, but like just continuing to read and educate yourself. There's so many great like homeschool books out there that people have written that you almost like kind of feel like you're friends with these authors like Julie Bogart and uh, Susan Wise Bauer. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and then they have their own Facebook pages and then you get involved in the community on those <laughs> groups too. It's like kind of never ending, but like keep reading and educating yourself and learning more about homeschooling right finding like-minded people in anything that you enjoy is it's important to have those connections so moving on so another thing that I really want to point out is how important it is to ask questions uh, to make it a point to learn from other families whenever you do get together because they've been there you're going to learn from them I've learned so much about homeschooling just being a part of conversations at these casual park days Uh, I probably would say by far it's the most education I have received as a new homeschool mom, just listening to other moms talk and being like a little, you know, fly on the wall as they discuss things. And I'm like, oh, write down, write down, write down Mm -hmm. some of the things that they talk about. Yeah, they didn't even know that they were our mentors, (laughs) like. That we had nominated them. Um, this, <laughs> well, and actually, that's one of my inspirations for starting this podcast yeah. is just the fact that these parents just help help so much uh, right. over the years. So, so now we want to help you. <laughs> so, you know, once you do find some of these groups like that, like show up and like keep showing up. Like go to a lot of events. Go all of them. Yeah, go all the time. In fact, uh, you know we've moved a lot, and when we move into a new town, like so that's the first thing we do. We join all the groups. <laughs> like way too many. Like everybody's like, this is crazy. Why are we doing like all these in the same day? But you know, you find then the things that you really like, and the people you find your people, and then you gradually kind of you know exit some of the other ones. But um, you kind of have to do that. You kind of have to start big and then narrow it down. Right. Sometimes it can be kind of tough to break in all these people all these moms have relationships already established and sometimes it's a little harder to break in but it's going to be a lot easier for you and your kids when you're when people start to recognize you when your kid made mud pies with another kid the previous week and they're like oh there you are let's play make more mud pies and so you just have that familiarity that's how friendships start so Exactly. It's a, it's just so much fun. Key and word of the day again, proactive. Totally be proactive. Yep. Um, let's talk about clubs. Yeah. Uh, we've both been part of, with our families of numerous clubs through the years. We've joined uh, ones that have existed and then when one didn't exist and our kid has an interest in something, well, we're going to make this club. Yep. Uh, <laughs> we've been part, let's see, I was part of an American Girl History Club mm-hmm. with um, my daughter and then because there were a bunch of girls going to this American Girl uh, thing and we were ending up with the brothers or, and and the one younger uh, girl sibling, Jillian, uh, the brothers and Beansy, that was her nickname back then. Uh, we'd all end up at a coffee shop and we were like, you know what? Why aren't we doing why, our own why club? Why are we sitting here at a coffee shop? We should be doing something. Yeah. So, so we started an adventure boy club, which then after American Girl disbanded became an adventure kid club. We had that going on for. Oh, that's when the cardboard boat regatta really began. Oh, it was. Uh, we did some really cool weaponry for a while like park days got really interesting there it was quite a melee right so uh geography club art clubs uh we're in gemin uh model united nations we Mm -hmm. were both in future city you you ran a future city yep which is like a engineering it's like a stem engineering competition it's actually a national competition that schools do same with model un uh both of those were groups that uh you know as homeschoolers you can still have your own team and show Mm -hmm. up at these we often were the only homeschool teams which is kind of fun or uh you know one of two it's just a few homeschool teams we've even won some awards the kids have actually won cash that they did a big shopping spree with i know that was 
was that was fun. Like oh, if they had been on a school team, that cash would have gone back into their school. But since it was a homeschool <laughs> team, they were like, let's split it all. Go to the mall. We each get twenty eight. Well, we, we had them vote. Remember, and they, yes. they didn't know what to do and nobody could decide. So we kind of I think we did a little poll and all the kids are like spending spree. So yep. they spent the whole day at the mall <laughs> drinking too much caffeine yeah. with star at starbucks and buying goofy things i think that's it's when so cameron funny. got those suspenders <laughs> oh gosh yeah they had a good time and we've uh, done things like board game club our friend had a a board game club that we did for years and years that was a lot of fun right. um oh, theater yeah. groups we do youth and government too still really any anything that your child has an oh gundam Gundam is an unknown. <laughs> Not very many people know about Gundam. It's these I don't little, know about Gundam. These little guys that you build and com- you design and paint and compete. And you can never find anything like that at school, that's for sure. So we found a Gundam club and Cameron <laughs> built them and competed against grown men. <laughs> oh, gosh, that's yeah. funny. So anyway, so within these groups, um, if there's not something or not a club that you can find that is interesting to you that you're, you know, I mean, a lot of times our kids have very specific interests, you can make something, just make your own. And again, the key word here is being proactive. Often these groups are centered around what I want my children to learn or what they're actually interested in at that moment. Okay, uh, moving on. So another way that you can be proactive, get to know other families, is to plug into your local library. The library system has come a long way, and I would really encourage you to take advantage of those programs. They tend to be overlooked resource for keeping kids engaged. There's so much out there. So they're, they've moved well beyond book clubs and just checking out books. There's programs offered, are they vary widely. And they're almost always free or very low cost. There's Bonus. puppet shows and craft making. Uh, there's technology classes. Uh, my kids took a 3D printing class there once and yeah. a photography class. Genealogy. Uh, lots of comedy shows and science shows that were sponsored by the local science museum. We did a lot of Lego build competitions. That was a lot of fun for them. Uh, they were both into Legos for years. Um, and oftentimes you can even find academic classes that are free. Yeah. So yeah. any type of skill set that you're wanting to hone in on, they're offered. Yeah, oftentimes. there's a lot of uh, we've done a lot of like computer classes or uh, like my son, who is really into photography, like did like an Adobe class there where he learned like some photo mm-hmm. editing and things like that. That And those are all free. Like some of them aren't even meant to be for kids. But the, you ask the librarian, they're like, oh, yeah, sure. You can come to that. Right. And oftentimes if a class isn't available and your kid's really interested in something, you can go to the librarians and say, hey, so I have a child really interested in this particular topic. Do you offer anything? And they say, well, no, we don't. But we can check around to see if there's interest and they'll actually ask their patrons if there's interest and then they'll start something up for you. Like they will do it for you. They're, right. Yeah. They love to do that. Yeah. They love to do that. I come from a, a long line of family librarians and I can tell you that they really enjoy right. helping other people. Yeah. We, um, when we lived in Georgia, we were part of a library system that offered a chess club on Mondays and it was really cool. It was just, it was just this lady who was really, really into chess and wanted to share this. But what ended up being super cool about it was that the area we were in was a, um, had a, a large refugee community. And so the chess games was a great way for a bunch of people with language barriers to come together. And it was multi-age and it was, it was such an amazing program. She would start like, you started the class and they would start with like one piece and like every week they would add another piece. And so everybody was like learning bit by bit how to play this game and like learning to communicate with others. It was, it was just, it was really, really, really cool. cool. Yeah. Okay. So another way that's really fantastic to meet other families and like-minded families is volunteering. Um, Your support doesn't just have to come from homeschoolers. Uh, get out in your community. It's a fantastic way to build relationships, uh, make a difference, and help others along the way. So Yeah, it's a, a great way to uh, get that socialization in with uh, people of different ages. And yeah, we um, love to volunteer. One thing to note that it's so important that once you find your people, once you find people that you've really connected with, that your children are connected with, take time and invest in those relationships because that's how you build long lasting friendships 
another thing to think about is to, and this has happened to me over the years, is to sometimes you have to reevaluate the relationships that you formed. Uh, sometimes you outgrow people or they outgrow you. And so you might have to shift some of those relationships when they're no longer working for you or your family. And, but that's okay. I mean, I mean, sometimes what is the whole old saying? One door closes, another door opens. Yeah. I mean, allow yourself room to form new relationships that are better serving for you. Yeah. And you especially notice that, you know, as your kids get older and more into specific interests, like, you know, it's a, it's okay. You don't have to still be friends with like the person you were friends with when you were seven, you know, you all are into different things and you know, you find, find the relationships that work for you. Right. And ultimately, once you have established and now you're in a group and you're creating clubs or you're joining clubs and your kids are really immersed, it's just essential to be welcoming to new homeschoolers. They could be your new best friend. Uh, there's sometimes I have to encourage my children when they're all honed in on their best friend and some new kid comes in and I have to remind them, you know, they were new at one point and they have to learn to, you know, that's what we want for our children is to teach them how to be welcoming and you know, learn how to meet new people. And yeah, think yeah. about how you felt when you were that person that was new to the group. So how to start your own group? Like what? You know, what if I can't find other homeschoolers like me or that like to do what we do? Like, is is there a need for this? Like. I, should I just build my own? Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. It's actually so easy. And like I tell people to build one all the time. Build it. Build it. They will, they will come. Right. What's that baseball movie? Yeah. You have an interest in something and nobody's put it together yet. Do it. You never know. Uh, my One of my best friends uh, was in a uh, move to a new area and could not find other secular schoolers. She was in a, kind of a Bible Belt area. And um so I was like, you know, there there are other secular schoolers. You might just not be able to find them because they can't find them either. So why don't you start a secular homeschool group? Word of the day again. Be, <laughs> yeah, proactive. be proactive. So she did. And like amazingly, like tons of people signed up for her group, like almost immediately. So they were just waiting. There was a need for it. So she built it. I've had a like a hiking group for years. Right. And over the years, I've been a part of, I think, at this point, three geography <laughs> groups that I've spearheaded. I love geography clubs for a lot of reasons. One thing that we did that was really fun, we would pick a certain country and each family, well, first of all, the kids would vote on which country. So we would go to the map and we would choose a certain country. And then for the next meeting, each family was designated to bring something, some aspect of that country. It may be the geography or the topography. And so you're at home with your family and you can make a map and draw. I mean, you can do everything from a salt dough map and you can bring that and show everybody. And so when it's your family's turn, then you walk up there and you can show all the other kids the topography or the area of whatever country that you're talking about. Uh, one family was in charge of the food, which was usually the host family. You'd mm. go over and you'd cook whatever food was of that region. And that's super fun. It's my favorite part is the food part. In fact, we were <laughs> part of the geography group. And when we did Cuba, your mom came and made food. Maybe your mom and dad. Yeah, and they made food. She made Cuban black beans. Mm, um, so <laughs> there's one recording where she was saying her name, which is her family name of many generations. And it took about two minutes to get through her saying <laughs> it. And all the kids' eyes were like wide, like, oh, my gosh. And often with this food, sometimes children's palates aren't very wide. But then when they're with other kids and they're excited about a region, they'll try foods that they might oh, not sure. normally try. Peer pressure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and there's always a game category. I remember when That's I so horrified my friend Jen with this chopstick game for China. But I'm um, <laughs> sorry, Jen, if you're listening. And I'm still sorry and horrified I did this. And I thought it'd be really fun for the kids to take cotton balls on one side of the yard and chopstick them and hold them and go to the other side and drop them in the bucket. Well, it was a race. So ultimately, I had our children running with chopsticks and almost took all the eyeballs out oh no <laughs> <laughs> but um anyway so uh we did a pinata when we did mexico and um 
we had some and another thing people are more sensitive like we had some celiac uh, children that had celiac so you know everybody's really sensitive about what went in the pinata and what went in the foods i'm on my third hiking group uh, from different cities and i started uh, our first one when we lived in atlanta and it was really that i just we I, well, I kind of copied it, for one, off of a friend that lived a little further away that had taken us on a hike in the woods and went to play in the creek and laid a picnic blanket out um, <laughs> that we sat and played on. And I was like, oh, this is really fun. I just want to do this over on my side of town with some of my friends and, like, let's learn about exploring in the woods. And so we did. I wasn't particularly outdoorsy at the time, but look at me now. We had that for years where we just did a, I booked a weekly hike every week and people would come and we would do it and have a picnic lunch and it was fabulous. That's crazy to me that you say you weren't outdoorsy then. I mean, you're the one that was, you were teaching the Adventure Kids Club and you <laughs> yeah. even taught orienteering. You did a great job. You look like a pro. Well, I'm, a, I've, I've come a long way, but. <laughs> <laughs> you never get lost. I always get lost. I usually take a mom with me and we get lost. I think Sarah, I Sarah with. and I like to get lost on your hikes. Um, I think I admin one of your other hiking groups, even, because you said you didn't want to go into the woods and get lost. Oh, yeah. I, I usually <laughs> lose one or two. If you come on any of my hiking groups, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I do not lose people. You guys can come join mine. But um, when we moved to Dallas, uh, that was uh, something I we talked about this in another episode. I was like, is there already a hiking group here? If not, I'm going to start one. And somebody was like, nope, there's not one. Start it. I didn't like overnight. Like I had 50 people join. I built it and they came like it <laughs> definitely was like something that I guess people were really interested in I called it a hiking and nature exploring club that were pretty solidly like a hiking group but and all you really need when you build your own group is you need just like a core group of people that attends all the time like my my hiking group has like 500 people in it 500 families but we really have like a group of like six families that come all the time um, but that's all you need is you know that core group my kids grew up on the trail we were already hiking but not to the degree as we were with Nicole's group it's just it's been huge for my family my kids have a love for nature we would find so many things we explored in the woods from rope swings to weird baby cars up <laughs> yeah we found some Remember weird stuff yes that was a weird we've one. had some big adventures for sure Remember the boat up in the oh tree. yeah <laughs> like some of our hikes have names like that like boat in the tree park like we're talking <laughs> like a, a full-size like boat yeah from the, like from, from a the flooding lake. it was it was very weird I still it, don't really understand how that got there but <laughs> but anyway like uh, ultimately like plan things that you want to do like this is how I approach the hiking group like I plan things I wanted to do in places I wanted to go anyway so that I wasn't ever disappointed if nobody else showed up you know it was something I was going to do anyway and honestly I've never not had at least one person show up so like well, you really just and one of the huge benefits about having your own group is you get to set the time you get to set the duration you get yeah. to set the topic make it convenient to you make it convenient for your schedule yeah also, we talked about uh, in our last episode, we talked about preschoolers and like um, some of the newer moms being super excited. I was always saying tap tap into that excitement of these young moms and encourage them to plan events. They're the ones that have all the energy and like excitement about stuff. Like sometimes as we get as our kids get older and we've got more actual like homeschooling work that we're trying to get done, we don't have as much time to plan events and plan things. But uh, these moms do like use them to your advantage. Bring on a team um, in our teen group. We actually bring on some teens. Uh, we were like, why do you really want a mom planning like all your events? Like you guys have an idea of what you want to do. So um, in our teen group, we've had a couple uh, kids that kind of took that over and planned events that they wanted to do. Another thing I wanted to mention is that there are a lot of opportunities and classes and things offered at your local rec center, like through your city, and extracurricular sports, um, baseball. My kids did baseball. It's not homeschoolers, and they met plenty of friends. Uh, they did all the fun things, and it wasn't even with the school district. I don't even know if they offer that at the younger ages anymore. Uh, I know here in North Texas, there are hundreds of classes and programs offered, and these are often like cheap or low cost too. Like we we belong to our local rec center for uh, the use of their gym, and it's seventeen dollars a month. Right, it's and, very affordable. Right, and these kind of activities also allow your kids to socialize with friends from many diverse backgrounds and find friends of common interests. 
Yeah. Um, so we were talking about some of that, like being, you know, non-academic. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about other academic options, uh, mainly like what are co-ops, university model, and micro schools. Co-ops are cooperative learning environments where multiple families uh, meet and share educational resources. So uh, typically these are parent taught or, you know, all families serve in some kind of role. Uh, They might have, you know, a a low cost, like maybe a facility fee, and everybody kind of pitches in to do this. I've also been part of a co-op where parents ran the program and like handled cleaning the facility and and all of that, but we actually hired out teachers for various classes. So some co-ops might include traditional academics, some might be more fluff, some are kind of a combo of both. Right. I've always enjoyed parent-led co-ops. One is my kids get exposure to different things from different types of people, but I'm still there. I'm still present. Sometimes I'm teaching my own kids. Yeah. And we've been part of uh, several different ones. You and I've been in a couple together. Mm -hmm. We've been in, we were in one for several years. Yeah, the last one that we were involved together with, that one was a lot of fun because each semester was a different theme. I think the first one that we did was the oceans theme. So every class had something to do with oceans or water or currents or, you know, some of the book clubs, like maybe they read Moby Dick or something like that. Yeah, it was really neat the way that they would theme things. We joined, we joined during the Harry Potter semester, which was really, really awesome. So that is a memory for the books. Yeah, but um, Percy Jackson was another one of the ones. That was like I think our kids lobbied hard for Camp that to Half be one. Blood, that was actually that oh, yeah, was my Camp favorite. Half Blood yeah. was what it was called. Yeah, I, that wasn't that one so popular that we also did Camp Jupiter, or was that all part of the same? I don't even know. I think it was. Every week we would have uh, one of the parents would dress up as a certain god or goddess, yes. and then the kids had to guess, and if they did, they got to win some prize. Yeah, little... we still have the costumes and one of the prizes, like on my bookshelf in our right. <laughs> in our Harry classroom. Potter, at home. We made wands. We did all of it. Yeah. yeah. And we uh, we had taught several classes, like you and I taught classes together before. We already or, talked about the worms. <laughs> we did not talk about drinking the urine. Oh, but I wasn't going to bring up. <laughs> but there, it was not. It was apple juice. It yes. was not urine. But the kids, though, did in think a it was survival urine. situation, you can drink your own urine. Well, once. the kids know once. that because we horrified them with that one. <laughs> yeah, I had to write an apology after that. We really did convince them that it was urine, and when you drank it, you were you were acting you were gagging like you were and you were drinking apple juice yeah you're a horrible person did a kid throw up i'm not sure (laughs) we also we also taught them fire that might have been like that's like something that could not happen at a a school oh my gosh the fire do you remember oh sasha um, Sasha almost combusted. It, well, it was Halloween. They were all in costumes. They were like in the costume. worst thing you want to do is have a fire. They had flowy costumes, and we were building a fire. We were in. Oh, I brought a fire pit, and we're literally <laughs> building a fire. And they had sticks. Sparks were everywhere, and there were. We did have a liability waiver. We were all protected. <laughs> Oh, poor Sasha. <laughs> no, but nobody got burned. It was all good. And you know what? Those kids all know how to build a fire correctly, and they know all about fire safety. And drinking <laughs> their own urine. Yeah. Okay. It was great. <laughs> it was great. Let's talk about university model schools. <laughs> All right. University model schools. <laughs> like a step down from our <laughs> survival skills class. All the feral children. I loved it. So many unschoolers at that one. That was a lot of fun. It was. So a university model school is one where uh, kids might attend classes in a more traditional teacher directed uh, manner and it, it's probably at a school campus like a couple days a week um, they're schooled at home the remaining uh, days of the week and um, these are usually older kids like uh, usually like middle school high school is a uh, university model right. style school um, the curriculum is determined by the school so you don't really have a say in that some schools follow a classical model of education mm-hmm. whereas others follow a more standard model And most, if not all, of the schools are faith-based. And this is usually weaved um, through the curriculum wherever it's appropriate. Uh, Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, you know, on homeschool days, like, parents are meant to emphasize the concepts that the students are learning in the classroom. So uh, they might even have to attend training sessions so that they can equip that at home. Um, But then the school also maintains a lot of the record keeping and facilitates any testing, including placement tests for incoming students so um they're you know they're an option uh some university model schools can also offer a la carte classes or like only certain subjects and ages so we were also part of a fabulous university model school right well it was prometheus at one point and then that shifted hands to our friend 
gen and so it was gray matter and unfortunately during covid all of that ended so yeah that's when we joined theater <laughs> yeah but it was a, it was it was a great time like we knew some people that did that as their entire educational option so they outsourced all of the classes uh, we typically would do like a science class maybe a writing class um, mm-hmm. uh, I think we would start like in middle school with one class and then in high school we would do a couple but right. um, so they're you know they're a great option personally for me I like to teach uh, all the younger grades well and dr. Reeds we'd like to do the elementary science classes because it's he's an an incredible guy if you're right if you're listening Brian we love you (laughs) Uh, but yeah so in the younger years I really like to do that but you know as it gets a little more rigorous and the the curriculum gets a little bit more intense I'm like okay let's go ahead and outsource a little bit more uh, and take that load off of me and uh, and the kids really thrive my kids I know when they're ready so so in the in recent years we've seen you know, kind of some different things like uh, micro schooling. We've known some like nature school kind of things that I would think probably quantify as a micro school that um, they're basically like, I say they're new. They're really a reinvention of the old one room schoolhouse where maybe class size is smaller than most schools. They might have mixed age level groupings. They might not meet all five days of the school week and their schedules are going to look a lot different from traditional public or private schools. So that that's a just another, I don't really know a whole lot about micro schooling. We also heard a lot about pods. Okay, that's what during I was During the thinking. pandemic. I thought that's when you said micro schooling, that's what I, I heard pod schooling. Yeah, the pod schooling, that's definitely a COVID conceived idea. I think. And I don't even really know that they're, that they really took off like, I, I think it was like talking about families, like maybe grouping together to like uh, pay a teacher to, I don't know. I see it often again on our like regional, like. Are you seeing it again during COVID? I saw all the time. Now I don't really no, see what, it. No, what I mean, I, I'll see people suggest it like, oh, oh you don't want to homeschool like yourself, like find a co-op or join a pod. And I'm always like, what, where, where are these pods? Yeah, I've never heard of that before. I, COVID. I don't know that they're actually a thing. Right. But I, I mean, they seem like kind of a cool idea. You know, the whole crux of it is that there's all kinds of different. Well, pod almost sounds a little bit like our little group set. Like when I made an art group, you know, we did the art every week. That was yeah. kind of like a pod. Is that what that is? It, I don't know. it can be. Don't know what a pod is. Yeah. That was a great episode. Yeah, a lot of information. Again, so make sure you check our show notes. We'll probably include some info on... Uh, yeah, groups and support there. groups. And if you ever find that you have any questions, uh, please, by all means, visit our website and send us an email. If you have a specific question, we'd be happy to answer it. We're going to have a Q&A at the end of the year. So send us your questions. Uh, let us know if you have anything specific for you or your family, and we'll be happy to answer it on the air. We'll see you next time for episode eight, holiday break and homeschooling. So we're going to be talking about how you stay on track during the long break. We're going to talk about incorporating the holidays into your school. Uh, We love to do all of the fun, crafty things and how to motivate your child after that long break. Don't like to take summer breaks, but I definitely like to take holiday breaks. And sometimes getting your child started back can be a little challenging. So we're going to talk about that. See you next episode. Cheers. Be sure to check us out on our website at btdthomeschool.com, as in been there, done that, btdthomeschool.com. You can join our mailing list and get news and updates on future podcasts. And be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, at the BTDT Been There Done That Homeschool Podcast.